2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, reading to verse 12. Paul writes, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul has been writing concerning the suffering that the church of Thessalonica uh, has been enduring. In his introduction, he had encouraged them by reflecting on the obvious fruit that they were bearing. He stated that he was obligated to give thanks and even to boast on their behalf. He gave thanks because their faith was growing exceedingly. He gave thanks because their love for one another was abounding. He gave thanks because their patience and faith was revealed in spite of the trials that they're enduring. Now, the, the afflictions that they've been enduring has been refining them and strengthening their faith. And so instead of throwing in the towel, they've held fast to the Lord and they've persevered. Because of this, Paul is rejoicing. He gave thanks to God on their behalf. Now, the Thessalonians knew that these afflictions, these pressures were to be anticipated. They knew that they were used by the Lord because the Lord would use these things to refine them and to strengthen them. Paul, when he was writing to the Romans in chapter 5, said to them in verses 3 and 4, not only that, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. So the afflictions they endure resulted in their love abounding toward one another. And under such pressure, the natural instinct would have been self-preservation, but instead of reverting to self-love, they actually began to sacrificially care for others. So he thanked God. He thanked God because in spite of the persecutions, they were still trusting in God. And they knew that God was working in the midst of all of the things that they're going through. In Romans, again, in chapter 8, verses 35 through 37, Paul said this. He said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So that's how believers learn to respond to the situations and distresses. They need to understand, we need to understand that persecution against us is inedible. It should not come as a surprise to any of us. What makes us think that we're not going to suffer? This is something that we should anticipate. This is something we've actually been prepared for. Paul says it, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus suffered on our behalf. 1 Peter 3, 18 says that Christ suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He suffered for us, and because he did, we see it as a privilege to suffer for him. That's what Paul says in Philippians 1.29 when he says, To you it has been granted. That word granted speaks of a grace gift. It has been given to you by grace on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also, he said, to suffer for his sake. It's revealing how outraged we believers can become when we encounter affliction or persecution. We say things like, this is America. I'm not supposed to feel rejected. I'm not supposed to feel uncomfortable. Well, Jesus prepared us for this. 
And we shouldn't be caught off guard when it happens. In, in Luke, in chapter 6, verse 22 and 23, Jesus said, Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. He went on to say, Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. So the anger that we Christians can exhibit when experiencing persecution is actually troubling. If the world hated Christ, why are we surprised when they mock us today? Now where does this angry reaction to the message of the gospel originate? It, it comes from a rebellion, a rebellion against God, and it's directed towards his servants. Jesus in John chapter 15 verse 20 said it like this. He said, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But he went on as he was sharing that, and he said, But if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So that encourages us to continue sharing, hoping that many will believe the message that we're bringing to them, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul is blessed. He's blessed because of growing through their afflictions, and he's blessed because of remaining strong. And that's evidence to him that they're genuinely converted to faith in Jesus Christ. You see, understanding afflictions is essential if we're going to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul rejoiced because they had an eternal perspective. They didn't have a, a temporary perspective. They weren't focusing on present comfort, personal fulfillment. They weren't focusing on, on happiness. They, they weren't moaning about injustice. They were settled on bringing God glory. And so as he's writing to them and speaking concerning these things, he goes on in verse 5 to say, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. They knew that God was wise and that God was purging his people through suffering. And their suffering wasn't how they were saved, but the reaction revealed that they were. And the suffering purged them and it was purifying to them. It, it was actually preparing them, making them worthy of the kingdom of God. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher of another day, said this. He said, most of the grand truths of God have to be learned by trouble. They must be burned into us with the hot iron of affliction. Otherwise, we shall not truly receive them. So he's saying, verse 5, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, this doesn't mean that Christians will earn the right and deserve to enter heaven because they suffer, but that they may show that they have such a holy character that it's proper that they should be admitted there. He's saying you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. So these afflictions and sufferings are how God prepares them to enter into heaven. Suffering is readying them for heaven. It's causing them to long to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. It causes you to long to be with him. My, my mom got saved, and, um, you know, she was, uh, my mama was about 40 years old when she got saved. And she, uh, you know, she was born in 1930. And so she had gone through a lot of things as she had grown older. And, uh, you know, she, she suffered with illnesses and a variety of things like that. But she also had seen the United States in, in a time when the United States was a beautiful place to live in. You know, and she saw the victory that the United States had in, in World War II. And she saw a variety of things and a lot of accomplishments and all. And uh, in the 50s and into the early 60s, she was very happy because things were going well. But later on, with the rebellion and, and all the things that took place, she started seeing a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. She saw, started seeing the rebellion that, that the youth had, the drugs and the various crimes and things that became uh, accepted. And at a certain point, my mom spoke to me prior to going to heaven, and my mama said to me this. She said, son, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go. She says, I just can't stand this, this nation anymore. I just don't like what I see anymore. And, and, and to a degree, I understood what she meant. Things have changed. They're not, they're not like they used to be. And, 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 and we can see that. And when you're young, you don't see it for what it is. But when you get older, you might start seeing it as it's deteriorating. And things are taking place. And things are being said. And things are being believed. And, and so many things are happening. You begin to realize the earth is not my home. 
And when you begin to start sharing with people the gospel and people are rejecting, they don't want to have anything to do with it. And not only that, but they begin to persecute you or afflict you because of that. You begin to real, realize that there's something better than what we're experiencing now. And you begin to long for that other country that you're, you're on your way to. And, and this is what happens is with the afflictions and suffering that believers go through, it begins to make us aware of the fact that the world isn't my home. The earth is not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a sojourner. I, I, I don't belong here. This is not where I'm supposed to be. And it readies you. It readies you for heaven. It causes you, like in my mom's case, to long to be with the Lord. These things are preparing them. And they know that there's something better waiting for them. In Romans 8, verse 18, Paul said it like this. He said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So the believers were suffering. They were awaiting entrance into the kingdom. The world was having its pleasures at that time, but the world was nearing judgment. And so he's speaking concerning this, and he says in verse 6, it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. It's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. The fact that you are suffering persecution is going to justify God's judgment on this world. He's going to bless you for the suffering you endure, but he will repay those who cause the pain. In Romans 2, verse 6, Paul said, God will render to each one according to his deeds. The book of Job, in chapter 4, verse 8, it reads, Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Now notice how Paul says, It's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation. Righteous. When he says it's a righteous thing, the word righteous means something without error or something that is correct. It speaks of that which is innocent or blameless, something that's just. He's saying God's judgment is a righteous judgment as well as a righteous thing. God's judgment is righteous because God is righteous himself. Psalm 51.4 says against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Psalm 75 verse 2 says, when I choose a time, I will judge fairly. So in saying this, Paul's encouraging them to wait on the Lord for what is called a righteous judgment. And as a righteous judge, he will repay them for suffering the suffering <laughs> that, he, that they had caused his people. And because of this, they should remain strong. They should not seek to avenge themselves. In Romans 12, 19, it says, Do not take revenge, my friends. Leave room for God's wrath, for it's written... It's mine to avenge. I will repay, saith the Lord. So the promise is those who have been afflicted receive rest in him. How do you see it? Well, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that we do not look at the things, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So ultimately, God will repay those who have troubled his children. Here's a beautiful verse, Mark 9, 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, this doesn't mean that God will not forgive those who persecute believers. God extends grace and forgiveness to those who have done so if they repent. And Paul is a great example of somebody who received God's grace. When I was uh, about 20 years old, was that about four years ago? <laughs> when I was 20 years old, no, no, I wasn't 20, I was, uh, I was 19. I grew up in Norwalk, and so I went to school, actually in Whittier, in a school called Sierra High School. And across the street from Sierra, Sierra High School in, in, uh, in Whittier was a tasty freeze. And the kids used to go there and hang out and all, and 
I was about 19 at the time. I'd already graduated, and I would go there once in a while to hang, hang out with my friends and all. And I still remember that I was there at this tasty freeze when this Jesus freak walks up to me. Now, I was a, a hippie at that time. I was, you know, into the drugs and everything that went along with that lifestyle. And like a hippie, as hippies were, some of us in this room are, are hippies, uh, ex-hippies. Um, you know, for me, it was like, you know, whatever you believe is cool, just don't, you know, just don't harm somebody. You know, whatever you want to do, do it, but just, just don't harm somebody. That's kind of how I was. If you want to believe in God, believe in God. That's cool. I don't care. Believe in God. We need people who believe in God. If you don't believe in God, then don't harm people. Just believe in what you believe. So I was really like that. I didn't really care. And so as far as religion was concerned, I'd been raised in, in the Catholic Church. I had some background in, 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 in things about God and all, just enough to be, to be um, aware. And here comes this Jesus freak, and he starts talking to me. And I'm, I'm, I just want to eat my ice cream. Why are you talking to me? You know, that kind of thing. So he walks up and he says, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And I said, that's cool, you know, whatever. Because see, I thought Jesus was a hippie. Because he had long hair, he had a beard, he had sandals. He's very cool, very loving. And so I thought he was a cool guy. That's kind of how I looked at him. So I'm willing to hear about him. And he says, I want to talk to you about Jesus. And I said, okay, fine, it's cool. And he starts talking to me. And I, finally I said, listen. I said, what makes you believe that he is who you say he is. He says, well, the Bible says he is. I says, well, how do you know the Bible is true? I mean, how do you really know that? I said, there are a lot of people, there's a lot of religions out there. You know, you got the Hindus, you got the Buddhists. You know, there are a lot of religions. What makes you think that the Bible is true? And why should I believe it? So I was typical of everybody else. Why should I believe it? And he says, it's because it's inspired by the Spirit of God. And I said, listen, I don't believe that. I said, frankly, you know what I believe? And he said, what? I said, I believe that the Bible was written by 12 guys on acid. They were just high, and they saw all kinds of stuff, and they wrote it down. I really, I really thought, why not? Why not? Well, because there was no such thing as acid. But beyond that, why not? And so I, 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 I kind of mocked what he was saying. I didn't disrespect him. But I said, you know what, what you believe is what you believe. Just don't, don't, don't expect me to believe it either, please. Shortly after that, I got saved. Shortly after, I came to faith in Christ. And then I went into the military. And so I was at Fort Ord. And I got permission to go to a chapel service. And I went to the chapel service. And there's this guy who had witnessed to me about Jesus as a chaplain's assistant. And I walked up to him, and I said, you won't remember me, but I remember you. You walked up to me at the Tasty Freeze in Whittier, and you told me about Jesus Christ. And I told you, I thought the Bible was written by a bunch of hippies who were high in acid. I said, I just want you to know that the Lord got hold of my heart, and I've gotten saved myself. And so God has a way, even when you're mocking, to, to, to put seeds in your heart and, and if you've been that way, if you've rejected, if you've mocked people, even harmed people, because sometimes people get so uptight when they hear the gospel, they may actually physically assault someone. Paul was that way. The apostle Paul was someone who was breathing out threatenings against those who followed Jesus Christ. It says in, in the book of Acts, in chapter 8, verse 3, as for Saul, who later became Paul the apostle, as for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And so he had this rejection, and he, he afflicted and persecuted. But after he was saved, Paul spoke of God's mercy and forgiveness. He wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. And he said, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Some of us here, some of you may have mocked and hurt believers, but God forgives. Those who reject mercy, persecute Christians, never repent. On the other hand, they receive judgment. In Romans 2, 4, and 5, Paul said, 
Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. There are people who say, well, you know what? God hasn't judged me yet. My life's doing fine. And Paul would say, no, you're storing up wrath. God is patient. He's giving you opportunity to repent. But ultimately, he will judge you. God will repay you. He's a righteous judge. And it is just to repay. With tribulation, Paul says, those who are causing the suffering. Those who trouble the church, he says, will receive recompense for doing this. God will repay them. In Psalm 94, verses 21 through 23, it says, They gather together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. But the Lord has been my defense, and my God the rock of my refuge. He has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord our God shall cut them off. So he says in verse 6, to give, uh, since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, verse 7, and to, give, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So those who reject Christ, he says, suffer tribulation. That word tribulation means distress or trouble. It speaks of suffering affliction. As a just judge, he's saying, God will punish those who are unjust and worthy of judgment. But, verse 7, but he will give you who are troubled rest. The word rest means relief or ease. It speaks of relaxation or restoration. It speaks of freedom. And rest is afforded to those who've been troubled as they have followed the Lord. Ultimately, the greatest rest is when we are with Jesus. Revelation 21 verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Don't you look forward to that time? No more mourning. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. It's all God. It's all God. I've seen a lot of that in my life. Growing older has its advantages and sometimes it has other kinds of things that are advantages in a different way. I've had a chance to see a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. As a, as a, a son, I buried my parents. As a son-in-law, buried my father-in-law. I've buried uncles and stillborn cousins. And I've seen a lot of hurt. And I've seen a lot of tears. And I've wept with a lot of people. I've mourned with a lot of friends. I've seen what, what disease does. I've seen healthy friends wither away through cancer. Big, strong, powerful men withered. And I, my mind goes to it even as I'm speaking. I hate death. I hate what sin has done to man. How many times are you going to cry with someone? How many times are you going to hold them? How many times are you going to bury babies? Bury your own mother and bury your own father. But there's a place that's waiting for us. There is no more tears, no more crying, no more grief, no more sorrow. And I look forward to that so much. To be with the Lord. No more, no more tears. No more tears. And it may be tough at some of the things we've gone through are. 
some of the pains that we've suffered, for being believers, some of the rejection and the hurt, some of the things that are said to us because of our faith in Christ. But there'll be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. We will receive rest. It says in verse 7, we receive rest when the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, in verse 7, when it says the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, that word revealed is a Greek word that means to be unveiled or uncovered. It speaks of being manifested or disclosed. It, it, it is uncovering something that had previously been hidden. You see, unbelievers don't see Christ. You could preach the gospel to somebody, but they, 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 it doesn't make sense to them. You can share with them the gospel and give them the scriptures and their eyes are closed. to 2 Corinthians 4 says it like this, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. If, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So unbelievers don't see him. They have no knowledge of him. But when he returns, he will be unveiled. They will see him as he is. The one they had not seen will be revealed in glory, but he'll be revealed not as their savior. He will be revealed as their judge. In Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains. A large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. So the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The term mighty angels is literally angels of his mighty power. Angels of great rank will accompany him in his second coming. And this is what happens, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In flaming fire, that's a picture of God revealing his glory and his wrath. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 11, it says, the Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number. Number and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It's dreadful. Who can endure it? Jesus in Matthew 16, 27 said, The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. I want you to notice that he is his wrath is expressed in Scripture by fire. In Psalm 97, verse 3, a fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. Psalm 50, verse 3, our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. So God's judgment falls on those who don't know God and the disobedient. Those who do not know God are those with no relationship with him. Normally, in the New Testament, when it says those who do not know God, normally that is referring to Gentiles, to non-Jews. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5, it refers to the Gentiles as those who do not know God. In Galatians 4, verse 8, it says, Indeed, when you did not know God, you served those by which, nature are not, which by nature are not God's writing to Gentiles. You did not know God. So he's saying that God is going to bring his judgment on those who do not know God, as well as those who do not obey him. Those who do not obey him normally refers to the Jews. That's because God gave them the, um, the prophets. He gave them the temple. He gave them the law. He gave them all of these uh, these things that they would have an ability to know who he is. He had revealed himself in that way, but they were not obeying him. In Jeremiah 7, 28, 
so you shall say to them, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. And so those who do not know God are the Gentiles specifically. Those who do not obey would include the Jews who have the law and, all, and refuse to obey. He's making his judgment fall on Jew and Gentile alike. They both have rejected the message of the gospel, is what Paul is saying, and they both will come under God's judgment. What's going to happen? Verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. They shall be punished with, notice, everlasting destruction. Now, some think everlasting destruction refers to annihilation. They could be annihilated, but that doesn't, it's not what it's saying. Everlasting destruction is a way of speaking of a separation that lasts for eternity. It speaks of a permanent exclusion from the Lord's presence and his glory. Permanent. Now, I have never had the ability to conceive of what eternity is. It, it's, a, a, it, it's a concept that is much beyond me. I don't know what it means. So I, I've tried to. I've tried to think of an illustration that might help me to grasp it. And I was sharing this with someone just the other day. And I said, I, I have begun to conceive of eternity in a very basic way. It's like if I had the task of counting every grain of sand on every beach in the entire world and to count every grain of sand in every desert on the face of the earth, and I had to count every one, every single one of them, and then when I finally get to the end, having to start over again. Eternity is beyond comprehension. It has no timeline. But that's what's going to happen to those who don't know the Lord. They will forever be excluded from his presence in a place of judgment. It's called everlasting destruction. In Matthew 25, 46, it says, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is God's punishment for sin, for the rejection of Jesus Christ. It is the final reaction of a holy God to sin. It is the final conclusion of his wrath. When you read of hell in Scripture, it's described in various ways. It's referred to as eternal fire in Matthew 25, 41. In Matthew 8, 12, it's spoken of as outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Revelation 14, 10, and 11, it is referred to as a place of continuous torment. It's called the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 20, verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The lake of fire is final judgment. It's where those who have died without Christ spend eternity. In Revelation 20, verses 13 through 15, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It is the absence of God. It is a place of intense anguish and is final. And there is no second chance. And Jesus spoke of it often that he might warn us. In Mark 9, 43, 9, 45, and Mark 9, 47, he said, if your hand, your foot, or your eye offends you, cut it off, pluck it out, rather than entering into hell, 
into the fire that is never quenched. And people have asked, how can a loving God send people to hell? The case is that hell is not created for man, but for the devil. In Matthew 25, 41, he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was just saved. I was reading the Bible the way I was taught. I began to read these passages. I had gotten to the book of Revelation. And when I was reading chapter 9, that's when I walked into the kitchen where mom and dad were. And that's when I told my dad, Dad, you're a good man. You're the best man I will ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Christ. I really believed that there was a place of just judgment and that my daddy was going there. And out of love for my father, I told him the truth. Today, it's not real popular to even mention hell. And yet the scripture is filled with it. And those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that is where they will abide. But that is also why we, the church, need to warn people and preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus. We have to. Now in verse 10, again in reading to the end, he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints, to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this, this calling. Fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is going to come bringing relief to believers. He will be glorified, he says, in his saints. We're going to receive our glorified bodies. We will bring him glory uh, for his salvation that he's given to us. According to Philippians 3.21, Jesus, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And we're going to worship him, and we're going to praise him. We'll sing songs of glory to him. And that's why in verses 11 and 12, he says, we're praying that God would count you worthy. I pray, he says, that God will count you worthy of this calling. In other words, that you remain faithful. I pray that you will honor the name of Jesus and live a great life for him, that you would walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, he said in Ephesians 4. He says that, that God will fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, that he may bring to maturity every desire you have for goodness, and that you may perform those good works. May he fulfill your longing for goodness. May you have a virtuous and a moral life. He says that God will fulfill the work of faith with power through you, May God increase your faith-filled works by his Holy Spirit, and may you produce even more. And then finally, that by God's grace, may the name of Jesus be glorified in you. May God empower you so that you are a mighty witness for Jesus Christ. God knows we need that in these last days. For the church to take seriously the message of the gospel, it's not a time to mess around. It's not a time for us to be playing Christian. It's a time for us to suit up and get into the battle because there is a battle going on, the mind and the soul of this nation as well as just the people. And we, the church, have been called uh, by God for such a time as this to know his word, to know his grace, to know how, how, how to proclaim his message, to pray for those who are lost, to tell our friends and our family when given opportunity, perhaps a neighbor or a co-worker or a student that we are in class with, whatever, about Christ, to invite them to church, to share with them the gospel. Why? Because the time is late. Christ is returning, and we need to be prepared. And the day is coming when the Lord will bring his judgment, and I want to rescue as many people as I can from that judgment. And that's what Christianity is. And people don't believe it. They don't believe it. We're living in dark days. May God open our eyes to see the truth. Christianity is not a boring faith. It's a warrior faith. It's a warrior faith. We, we aren't people who walk around kind of with a silly smile. and We are people who enter into the fire to pull people out. And that's what God has called us to do. If you want an adventure in life, 
Turn on for Christ. Get real with Jesus and watch what happens. And then rejoice at the day when you see these people come to faith in Christ and their lives are transformed. And then you'll see that God is real. And then one day in heaven we'll be able to rejoice with them because they heard, they believed, and they're there because you were faithful in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God help the church to awaken in these last days.